Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Classroom 2.0 live show for Saturday, August 9th. Today's topic is our featured teacher for the month, who is Kyle Pierce. I'm one of the show hosts, Lori Moffat, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. And thank you, Tammy, for doing closed captioning. Here is Kyle's website, tapintoteenminds.com. Here's the link for the live binder for today. Remember, the pages in the binder are on tabs on the left-hand side rather than tabs across the top. This link will not work. Peggy is going to put the link in the chat soon so you can get right to the live binder. All of the recordings for Classroom 2.0 Live are posted on the Archives and Resources page at this link, live.classroom20.com slash archive dash and dash resources dot html. And also, Peggy will post that link as well. We always like to find out where in the world you're logging in from. I am logging in from central Pennsylvania. Now, in order to get the tool to work, uh, although if you're on a mobile device, you probably don't have the tools, you can type into the text chat where you're located. I know um, Peggy's from Phoenix, Arizona. Tammy's logging in from Southwest Arkansas. Tony's logging in from Alberta. I'm not sure where Kyle's logging in from. Windsor, Ontario. We usually have an international audience, and we do today as well. We've got someone logging in from Italy. And we may still get some late Mozambique. Here's our first poll question. Again, the tool is going to look like this, but where you vote is in the participants window. Do you teach math? Please add your grade level in the chat. Give you a chance to vote on that, and then I'll post the results to the whiteboard. Forty-two percent of the people in the room voted, and they voted yes. Only ten percent said no. The next question. Do you teach in a one-to-one -one classroom or school environment? Again, I'll give you a chance to vote. And again, from those that voted, 15% said yes, 40% said no. Our third polling question is, do your students use technology to explore math skills and concepts and to share their learning? Again, I will post those results to the whiteboard. 
so we can see how people voted. 60% said yes. Only 10% said no to this question. So again, today's topic is our featured teacher for the month. And our special guest is Kyle Pierce. I'm Lori Moffat, one of the show's co-hosts, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore. I'm going to turn the mic over to Tony, who's going to introduce Kyle and introduce the newbie question for today. Thank you very much. Um, Kyle Pierce is a secondary math teacher, as well as an intermediate math coach um, in Southern Al sorry, Southern Ontario. Um, he's leading a ministry-funded one-to-one iPad project called Tap Into Teens Minds. He uh, is an Apple Distinguished Educator from the class of 2013 and is currently working to become a Google Certified Teacher. He is teaching at the Tecumseh Vista Academy. It's a K-12 school in the morning. And he focuses in the afternoon on the Middle Years Collaborative Inquiry Project in the afternoon, where he is uh, a coach to 29 other um, schools. And uh, we've got a few quick details from Kyle, he said that he is married to Chantal and they have two kids, Talia is two and Landon is four months old. Um, I thought this was so interesting. My wife has successfully convinced me to go skydiving, bungee jumping, and hang gliding. Now how's that for an exciting math teacher? <laughs> I'm sure he has lots to tell his kids. Anyway, I hope you'll join with me in welcoming Kyle. I'm very much looking forward to his presentation. And we will advance to the newbie question here. What does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? So we'll uh, turn that over to Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. Hi, everybody. Thank you for the welcome, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm glad I could be here and uh, join you for this excellent, excellent uh, learning uh, experience through the webinar format. This will be uh, one of my first, I, I suppose, full presentations via the online webinar. I've done a few small 10-minute uh, chats here and there, so I'm really excited to uh, to see how things work. Um, I'm already really enjoying uh, looking at the chat and seeing kind of the, the Twitter atmosphere going on while we're also getting to uh, dig into something a little bit deeper. So to uh, get back to the question, what does Web 2.0 mean to me and why do I use Web, Web 2.0 tools in my classroom? And uh, for me, uh, th this question and, and my answer, I suppose, continues to grow um, over time. I've always been looking to technology to make everyone's life easier. Um, at the beginning, when I began using a, a projector and PowerPoint at the beginning of my career and then slowly uh, evolved into using a smart board in my classroom, I really found that uh, the use of media and even just having colorful, um, colorful media with graphics and video was really engaging for the students, or at least much more so than, uh, than the traditional um, chalk and talk style and method. Um, now we're using iPads, and originally I was really trying to make things easier for students so that they could get to the math rather than focusing on the copying and doing a lot of the things that we do in class that uh, have, have proven to be very ineffective uh, uses of our time. So that was the goal, but now I'm leading, leaning more towards trying to get into a creation environment rather than a curation environment where, and I, I've done a, a chat recently talking about those two things, that I feel that a lot of the things we do in school is simply taking what other people have learned and what other people have done, um, and we're, we're simply, simply sharing this knowledge rather than having students become creators themselves. So um, I'm really moving towards the inquiry and discovery-based learning model um, with, while also trying to maintain some of the you know fundamentals that are important, especially in a, a topic like mathematics. So, um, although my answer might be a little broad there, I think the Web 2.0 tools really allows us to focus in on students creating and, and the interaction between students, between the students and the teacher, and then obviously between the students and the rest of the world. So, that's um, 
uh, that's where I am now. But, uh, you know, if you ask me that same question next week, I'm sure that uh, it would change uh, substantially because things are changing and, uh, and even just perspectives over time as we learn more, more new things, um, they'll continue to evolve as well. So with that, uh, I think we're going to be moving on. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're going to move right into the presentation now. Uh, I don't hear anyone else talking, so I think that's the way it goes. There we go. Excellent. Perfect. Um, so thank you for that, that great inter introductory question. Uh, my contact information is up on the screen. Definitely feel free to interact with us through the chat window today. Um, I'm, I'm very active on, on Twitter and, and other social media as well, but Twitter seems to be kind of my home base. And uh, you can always email me directly if there's anything in particular that uh, you know, you'd like to, to dive into. So um, I'm, I'm actually reading the chat as I'm talking. So if I'm ever pausing, it's because I, I noticed there's some really interesting um, chats going on there. So uh, hopefully that uh, won't distract people. But uh, a little bit more about me. Once again, my, uh, my family, as, as was introduced by Tony, um, my wife Chantel here in the picture, and my daughter who is just has just turned two in May. She just went down for her nap. Thank goodness, because things might uh, be a little bit louder on my end. Um, she's a, a cute, cute little gal. And then our newest addition to the family is Landon, and he's just over four months. Um, I'm a math teacher in the morning, and I switch my duties over to math coaching in the afternoon through the Middle Years Collaborative Inquiry Project, where I'm working with about 29 schools across my, my district. My district's quite large in comparison to many of those in the U.S. Um, that seem to be, you know, quite small, some even just having one high school with theater schools. Uh, we, we actually have 15 high schools. Um, and a total of 76 schools total across our district. So uh, I'm working with between 105 and 130 educators um, in the afternoons through plenary sessions as well as some online learning sessions similar to this, um, but lots of opportunities for people to uh, interact throughout the session. So um, I'm also a dis uh, distinguished educator through Apple and an Apple authorized trainer. So I really enjoy doing those things, working with other educators. Uh, I find that when I do full day sessions, uh, I'm, you know, usually walking away with more new knowledge than those walking from my session. So it's great because uh, you get all the, the people you get to meet and learn from. Um, so once again, Math Lee Pierce is, uh, is my name. I know you can definitely use the hashtag from today's session. Um, I always say if you want to hashtag TITM for tap into team minds, that would be great as well. I'll do my best to answer out of the chat box, and then after the session, obviously, we can uh, continue the conversation through Twitter. And uh, to clarify, I, I thought we would go a little more in depth of where I'm from. You'll see in the red bubble here, um, right where it says Emeryville, we're in the next town over called Bell River, and that's just outside Windsor, Ontario. That's this big uh, blob over here. And my school is actually in Tecumseh where the green arrow is pointing to. So uh, a K-12 school and uh, we're, you know, we can see the Renaissance Center from Detroit right from my classroom window. So we're, we're relatively close to Detroit um, but still in Canada and, uh, and really, really enjoy the locale. And for those of you interested, if you're a geography teacher out there, this island down here, my wife and I were there yesterday. That's the most southern part in, point in Canada. Um, obviously not on mainland, but Pili Island is actually below, I believe it's more south than portions of 25 states in the U.S. So a little tidbit of information for you there. So um, just going on to, um, to uh, where I guess I began my journey. I know we've talked about it through the Web 2.0 conversation or, or answer to that question. Um, I have a theory of action, and I, I try to share this with my teachers because I think when people begin their technology journey, many times we begin with kind of our compass set in the wrong direction, and, and we're usually looking for ways to save the teacher time for making the teacher's life easier, maybe making the student's life easier, but we're not really addressing any particular student learning needs. Um, so my theory of action I try to share with teachers is that we really have to focus on the effective teaching practice first and foremost, and using the technology in transformational ways is how 
we can combine those two things in order to increase student success. So that's a theory of action that we use in my board. Um, and we'd like to keep it very simple, but it's very, very important that, uh, that we do focus on the effective teaching practice first and not consider technology as a replacement for the teacher, but rather a tool that will allow us to, uh, you know, to really redefine what it, what it means to learn math as well as any other subject area. Uh, a little bit more about my classroom. I actually, my project was funded through the Teacher Learning and Leadership Program. Um, there's a link on my website. Uh, if you hit the TLLP button on my main, main nav bar, um, you can learn a little bit more about that program. It's, it's been a great opportunity. Essentially, I, I put a proposal through and uh, wanted to redefine what it looked like to learn mathematics through the use of technology. And uh, that's why I do have those 30 iPads in my classroom with a projector and Apple TV. Uh, I teach every day where we are um, teaching directly from an iPad over Apple TV. My students are creating all their math digitally and we're sharing it over that Apple TV similar to how I'm sharing with you today. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like, what the lessons look like, um, how, how we do some of our, our sharing as well as how we do some of our exploring and discovery using the technology. So I like to start by talking a little bit about what we call or what I call the four-part math lesson. In Ontario, we focus on a model called the three-part math lesson. And some people get it confused with three-act math tasks. It's very different than uh, what Dan Mayer is, uh, is alluding to with his three-act math tasks. This is kind of a lesson format um, that I've modified to kind of suit the way I like to see my lessons being developed. So we'll go through that. I'll also share a link in just a moment that will give you um, access to some of the YouTube videos that go along with the example I'll be using. Uh, I'll paste that right now. Here we are. And I apologize, I may have accidentally copied a little too much in that link. Let's see, there we go. That should work for you, that link that just popped up on the screen. You might have to chase it as people are ty uh, typing. I'll add it one more time for you. Um, but essentially, as we go along here, I'll show you how we go through these four parts on a typical day. Obviously, this isn't, um, you know, this isn't every single lesson because obviously things change and, and sometimes you need more time for practice and so forth. But when we're introducing topics, I like to follow a minds-on inquiry, connections, and consolidate approach to our math lessons. So let's take a look at what that looks like. First off, um, the workflow in my classroom once again, iPads with the Apple TV, and we're using the AirPlay feature. You can see the screenshot down at the bottom here. Um, and what I'll do really quickly, I'm going to see how well this uh, screen sharing works for us. I'm, interesting, uh, I'm interested to see if I'll be able to share my iPad here. We're yeah, waiting for it. Doesn't seem to be appearing. I'm not getting the list that I had before. So I might just come back. We'll try it again in a moment. Um, but you can see the, um, the AirPlay button at the bottom. And typically, all the students will have that AirPlay button since we're all on the same Wi-Fi network. And it allows students to select the Apple TV. Um, on the screen, you can see it says Kyle's MacBook Pro. By clicking on that, students would be able to essentially take over the screen and share what they're doing on their iPad. So um, we use that as our our environment, our digital learning environment, in order to facilitate our four-part math lesson. Um, once again, a ton of different apps are used, but some of these come up more than others. The camera is obviously a very, very um, useful uh, built-in feature for the iPad. That's one, one reason right there that I, I always say, you know, an iPad versus a Chromebook, I really would miss. Um, the camera, the ability to be really portable and taking photos of whatever we'd like or videos of whatever we'd like on the fly. Um, this app here is called GoodNotes. We'll take a look at that in detail today, as well as Google Drive, which is our cloud service we're using. We use a WordPress platform for blogging, and Doceri is uh, kind of our, our main screencasting app. However, there are some others that we will share. 
So that's essentially the workflow. And as we get going with this four-part math lesson, I'll give you an example here of a minds-on. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to essentially take a video. So this is, um, these are snapshots or screenshots from a video that you'd find back on that three-act math task link. I'll post that link again. Um, this is called stacking paper. And this particular task shows me, as well as my custodian in my building, we're stacking a bunch of photocopy uh, paper. So we've got all these different packages and we're really trying to um, get kids thinking. And ultimately, the first video simply shows students um, watching these, these papers being stacked or these packages of paper being stacked. And then ultimately, at the end, they need to determine how many stacks of paper there are. Um, so it starts off very simple. And then we start to extend it to the lesson a little bit further. Um, you know, we might, once students are using the minds on, they might get some information such as the fact that the width of each package is 4.95 centimeters. And now they're going to get in this Dan Mayer three act math task uh, sort of model, they're going to get more and more information to kind of explore and, and essentially create their own solution. And it could be in any way, shape, or form. I don't want them necessarily following any type of procedure because we haven't actually shown them a procedure. Um, and I, I like in the chat, Peggy saying this, this kind of activity would work in any grade level. I totally agree with you there. Um, even some of the tasks that might be more suitable for maybe a grade nine classroom or a middle school uh, classroom, the really easy ways that you can modify the information you're giving or maybe even just the question that you're going after with the students so that, um, you know, that there's a, a nice easy entry point for any student um, to get started. So with this Minds On, students are, are now working together. Um, they're kind of building, doing some sort of question based on the topic from the previous day. So here they had already been using proportional reasoning, and now they're going to uh, determine how tall this stack of paper is. And then finally, once we've recapped that, we, we give them something to kind of extend their thinking just a little bit, and more or less reiterating the, the topic from the previous day. So in this particular example, uh, we then show them a slightly thicker stack of paper. And what we're asking them now is to determine how many thick packs of paper would it take to reach the ceiling. And we're trying to get the kids thinking of, you know, what matters here? What's important? Um, what about this problem will stay the same regardless of how thick each package of paper is? We're not necessarily using any language. Um, as we develop more language, we'll start to give that 4.95 centimeters an actual, uh, an actual uh, name. But right now, we just want them to kind of prove to themselves that they can do the math. And we don't want to, you know, bog them down with the, um, with the terminology or with the algebra and so forth. And once they've done that, we move on to the inquiry process where you know, they, the minds on typically, as I mentioned, they're doing something very closely related to the lesson from the previous day. Now, now, as after they've done that minds on, they've got their minds thinking, you know, they're building some com more confidence with the topic from the previous day. We now throw them a new question, and I call this kind of the inquiry section of the class, uh, where we change the scenario slightly. So in minds on, we had the, um, the thin packages of paper, and then we took a, a very small jump to thicker stacks of paper. Essentially, you know, redoing the same process would, be, would make the student successful. But now we're changing things a little bit because those stacks of paper were on the floor. And now we're asking, how tall is this table? And we're only giving them the height of the five stacks of paper on this table, and they also know how thick each package of paper is. So at this inquiry phase, this is where students are really working together, really trying to essentially crack the code as to like, how can I do this? Is there only one way to do this? Is there more than one way to do it? And students quickly realize in my class that there's usually more than one way to do things, and they then start challenging themselves to try to find more efficient ways. So that's the inquiry piece. And you'll notice here, I just wanted to share some student work from this particular problem. 
Um, you'll notice the handout on the screen. Um, that's what they would have to work with because they already know the information from the previous day, the 4.95 centimeters thick, and now they have the image of the table with the five stacks of paper on it. Uh, and then they have some area to actually work on their iPad. And they get to then use the Apple TV to share what they've done in order to find this particular process. Now, I'm showing this student's work first. Um, this student, his name was Calvin, and he was actually in uh, what we would call an applied level math class the previous semester, which is kind of like a remedial class. It mean, means that, you know, students who maybe had struggled through elementary school with math weren't meeting the standard. Um, we, we call that a level three here in Ontario. Uh, this student took the applied class, did very well, and wanted to challenge himself to the academic level, which is our highest level in math. And uh, he did very well, and I'm sharing his work because he always found ways to do things before the procedure, which I thought was great. And I think it really boosted his confidence to realize that he can do the math and it doesn't always have to look like complex algebra. So in this case, he started with just the fact that he knew there's two variables, his stacks, his number of stacks, and his height in centimeters. And he started with five stacks at 130.75 centimeters and simply worked his way backwards to determine what the height with zero stacks would be, which is our initial value or our height of our table. And then we extended it to using the proper terminology to realize that the height of the table is our initial value for our linear relationship and 4.95 centimeters is what we call the rate of change or the slope. And by doing it this way, we're not just telling students terms and definitions that they have to then copy or um, simply use procedurally in, you know, 20 questions in a row. They're now seeing what this really means. Rather than us having them do it, I, I feel that in my, my schooling, I just did things over and over again, repetition, memorization, but I never really had an understanding as to when to do it, why to do it. I knew. Uh, I, I could tell by the type of question, because they looked similar, what to do. Here, students don't need the procedure. They can do it on their own using just arithmetic and logic, and then they can start developing their own. They're, they're inquiring to find their own way to do it without um, maybe doing a table. Uh, you'll see another piece of student work here. This is a student who was uh, one of our higher achievers in the class, just to kind of show you a little bit of contrast. Um, this student really wanted to go above and beyond to show that she had a complete understanding. And this is the where I think the communication in math is so important. Um, going back to Calvin's work, he has a very clear understanding. And to be honest, by teaching him throughout the semester, I know that he can do it more than one way, um, but he's just not showing it here. But what this student wants to do is she essentially wants to say, listen, I know how to do this in every possible way, including a graph, including in a table, using just simple, simple arithmetic, as well as using y equals mx plus b, as well as substituting in for the algebra. Um, so this student's really trying to go for that complete solution. And, uh, you know, it's great when you get to have a student share this so that other students can see, you know what, there's my graph. or there's my, uh, my algebraic equation I used. They get to make those comparisons and see whether they're on the right track or not. So skipping ahead, that was, that's our inquiry. And, and what we want to do at this point is taking, taking those, student, the, those student approaches and start talking about them. And, and not, I want to really make this clear, we're not trying to disrespect any type of approach, but more or less talk about which ones are most efficient. And when we talk about that, we always are very clear that it doesn't matter if you use the most efficient way, but in the long run, you're probably going to want to move more, uh, at least get closer to that more efficient way, which typically is the algebra. Um, so when we go back to Calvin's work and we say, you know what, you've got a, a great table here, lots of logic here, you know what you're doing. Did that take you more time or less time than possibly using the algebraic approach? And what we're trying to get the students to hopefully convince themselves of is the fact that we can make connections to the actual algebra in order to save us time. 
And that's what the math is for. That's why we're teaching them algebra is to save them time, not wasting their time. And uh, that's the big, the big kind of aha I'm looking for in my classroom every single day is I want students to walk out of there saying, I completely understand why we learned that. And it was because it's to make my life easier. If we're not saying that when we leave our classroom, then you really have to scratch your head and wonder, like, what are we doing here? Why did I get up in the morning to come to school if I'm just learning a bunch of, you know, memorized procedures in math class, but I have no idea why? Um, and I feel that this method has really allowed my students to kind of see that and understand that. So um, that's where we make the connection. Typically, I would show you a video here, but because of our online format, I can't. I'm just showing you the screenshot of the last um, kind of stage of the video. Um, but ultimately, we as a class would then take this information and we make the connection and we try to determine, you know, what is that efficient uh, method and what does it look like algebraically. And, and what you see on the screen is another example of how we would make that connection. And then finally, in our fourth and final part um, to our math lesson would be consolidating all of what we've learned, okay? And, and connections and consolidate, they're very closely aligned, I, I believe. But here's where I feel that we're now giving the students a chance to take some problems that maybe aren't so real world. This is where some of, you know, those old style problems that they might see on, you know, sadly on a standardized test down the road or, or from a textbook or maybe from another teacher later in, in high school. Um, this is where they get to start looking at the problem and hopefully paint themselves a picture as to what what's really going on here. And you'll, I picked this example um, for you to see here. It just says, find the equation of a line with a slope of 2 and passes through the point 1 comma 5. Straight out of a textbook, the only thing I've done here is I've added a grid for them to use if they want. Um, but most students will be able to do the algebraic uh, method. But what I'd like to challenge them this coming semester, when we have this type of problem, I'm going to challenge them to give it some context. So what could the slope of 2 represent? And what could the point 1 comma 5 represent? So get kids thinking and get them talking about, OK, I've got slope and I have a point. What is the slope? And I guess what are my two variables that we're comparing? So are we talking about hours and pay? If my slope is 2, if we're dealing with hours and pay, after one hour, I earn $5. Well, if a slope is 2, that means I earn $2 an hour. And, you know, what kind of story can we put with this math to really show and communicate that you understand what's going on? So that brings us through um, essentially kind of a, an, a look into my classroom. We are using the technology. I, I wouldn't suggest that the, the iPads, just from what you've seen so far, are necessarily redefining everything we've done. A lot of it is just simply the, um, the teaching instructional practice that we're using here rather than, um, you know, rather than us, um, I just lost my train of thought there, saw a few things pop up on the screen, I, I apologize there folks, but, uh, but yeah, sorry, rather than, um, rather than us using the, the technology to do, you know, crazy things, we're just changing the way the math class looks and we're doing it in a fast and efficient way. Um, what I couldn't do prior to using iPads in my classroom was the fact that students wouldn't necessarily be able to share all of their solutions as often as they do. Um, by keeping it digital, they can, they can share it up to the screen very quickly um, without, without uh, wasting time or using up time that's going to be net needed for us to make connections later. So that's really valuable. But then I think we'll, we'll kind of slide into some of the other things we can do now that our content is digital we can have them starting to create and having them start to, you know, share their, their knowledge with the world. So that's where we'll head next. Um, but before we get to that place, I want to show you a little bit um, behind the scenes. Um, a few people were saying it's great to see, uh, great to see the student work. And some people typically ask what app I'm using to allow students to do that. And that's where this app called GoodNotes 4 comes in. So I'm going to attempt again to try and share my iPad screen here. So I'll give it another go. Let's see uh, how we make out with the screen share. 
let's give it a shot. There we go. Perfect. Uh, you know what? I must have um, accidentally disabled it before. So I'm going to give that a share. And you should be able to see an iPad screen here. And it looks like Peggy says hooray, so that must be a good thing. Awesome. So we've got uh, my iPad here. This is an iPad 2. Um, so if you do see delays, it could be the internet. We'll blame it on the internet, but it might be the fact that you know I'm very close to my uh, my 16 gig storage on my iPad 2. So I'm hoping to make an upgrade at some point. But this is the uh, the iPad 2 is what we use in my class currently, and the app I'd like to show you is GoodNotes, and it's this white one here. It is $5.99 on the App Store, which might be a little pricey for some. Um, a lot of people choose to use New Annotate, which I will type into the chat window, N-E-U dot Annotate Plus. That one, I believe, is only $0.99. Cents. And, uh, and that one works well also. However, I made a switch to GoodNotes simply because of how smooth it runs. So I'm going to click into GoodNotes, give you kind of a tour of what it looks like. Um, usually when you pop in, you're going to come to what we call your bookshelf, which is just a bunch of files. You can see here I have all kinds of, all kinds of great things going on here. Um, let's jump into, they're all PDF files, by the way, I should mention. Um, and, and what it allows us to do is to take a PDF file and it allows us to actually annotate over top of it. So I'll jump into this first one here, this Pythagorean theorem one, just to give you an idea of what the students would see. So they would see this guy here. And um, usually I give them some kind of a rundown as to what we'll be doing. And the best part is, is on the fly, we can actually do uh, some writing. So today, that's a little thick. Let's slow that down. So it's Saturday, uh, August. What is the date? 9th, 2014. So you can see the pen tool is actually very, uh, very smooth. Um, on your screen, it might look a little choppy or simply because of the connection, but it's very, very smooth on my, uh, on my end here. Um, some great things that you can do typically when we are connected, I'll show you a few awesome ways for zooming. The first one I'll show you is this option up here. It's a pen. If you give that a click, basically what I have at the bottom of this little box that's appeared, this little rectangular box, is the zoom window. And I can do all my writing in there, and it will appear wherever the zoom window, um, uh, I guess the other zoom box window will appear. So these guys are essentially connected. Um, this is simply a zoomed in version. So wherever I place this guy, if I want to you know, put a little arrow, you can see up at the top here, that little arrow's appeared. So I can write really big here while being zoomed out on the screen. So it allows me to, you know, do a lot of things efficiently. I could have the screen completely zoomed out like so, and I can do, you know, some actual math. And you'll notice that little blue box at the end, I'll do it again. So when we're at the bottom, if I'm going to solve this equation, and move this over. I'm going to grab just a different uh, colored pen here. I'm going to subtract three, and I'll do that on both sides. And you'll notice this blue box right here. All that's doing is saying it's showing the very edge of what I've written on this side, and it allows me to keep writing, so I don't have to do anything. I can keep writing on the same line. And it just keeps things really, really easy, really smooth um, as I'm kind of making my notes. Obviously, you can zoom in old school style here just like this, and we can do some math, you know, real zoomed in. This, I find this is great for students as well simply because it allows them to really focus on the task at hand. Um, so lots of cool things going on in this app with two fingers. I can swipe to the next page. So this is a multi-page um, PDF file that I've put together here, um, which is about the Pythagorean theorem. And you can see here, this is the taco cart problem by Dan Mayer. If you haven't used it before for Pythagorean theorem, you really definitely need to. 
And you'll notice we haven't even introduced Pythagorean theorem yet. We're actually going to have them do the task. So this would be, uh, we did a minds on. It was related to something we did the day before. It wasn't anything too spectacular. We'll do a boo for that. But, um, but our actual inquiry piece here um, goes through, and it actually has the students solve a problem that involves two people on the beach. And the video shows one person walking up to the path and over to the taco cart, and the other person walking straight across the beach. And the, where the problem comes in is the, the fact that most students would know that it's quicker to take the hypotenuse. However, you walk slower on the beach and faster on the road. So they have to go through and do some math. And most of my students will do this through kind of an inquiry approach. And then they'll find that they need to use some sort of math in order to determine the length of the hypotenuse. And that's where we start to introduce the Pythagorean theorem. So I just wanted to give you kind of a brief outline of uh, what GoodNotes looks like. It's a great app. Um, I'm a big fan. Some things you can also do, you'll see up at the top corner of the screen. We have um, the option to add an image. And you can do this right from your camera or from your camera roll. So I'll do that right now in, in my house. I'll click the camera button. And you can see my iPad camera. There's the camera, my dirty desk, and uh, my phone. So if I really needed a picture of my phone, I could do this on the fly. There it is. We can use the photo. And there it is up on the screen right here for students to use. So some great things that you can do in the app. You can export the, the, um, the PDF file with annotations. You can export all your pages. And you can send it wherever you want to go. When I click the Export button, I can send it to any of my cloud storage. I can send it even to an external app. So if I want to send this off to uh, who knows, let's, let's give external apps a, a click and see where I can actually send this. Here you go, a list of all these different apps I could send it to. If I want to send it straight to Nearpod, uh, which is an app I'll be using a little bit more this year, um, I'm, I'm really excited to uh, really dive in. But you can see here, these are all the apps I could send it to. Essentially, any app that will accept a PDF will uh, accept what you've done in GoodNotes. But before we go, I really want to uh, show you a couple other really, really cool tools. This will allow us to skip over a bunch of slides. When I click on the Options button, and for those, if, I, if you're still in, the, uh, in a file, if I come over to the top left corner where the arrow is, that'll bring me back to my bookshelf. And at the bottom, bottom right, is the Options menu. Under Settings, not only can I back this thing up straight to the cloud, I have an automatic backup option that will essentially let me select a folder in any of my cloud storage um, accounts. I'm using Google Drive. I've created a destination folder called GoodNotes Backup, and we're saving it as a PDF. What this does, after every single edit I do in GoodNotes, it will automatically re-upload that file to the cloud. So if I'm teaching from GoodNotes in my classroom, and I'm done for the, for the day, or done for the period, and I, as soon as I get out of GoodNotes and I go over to my computer, I can then access everything I did from the class as a PDF file. So I can share it to the course website, I can, uh, I can email to a parent if they wanted to see or a student's absent. Whatever you need to do with, uh, with that, you have it all. For my students, they all share a folder with me, and that's how I can access student work on the fly. So everything that's done digitally, I essentially have a digital, a digital workbook of all my student work, which has really made my life um, more, uh, more convenient. It's great on parent-teacher interview days, so I can pull up all their work not have to collect books and so much, so much um, and, and you know hassles such as that. So that's another big thing. And then finally, the last one is the ability um, when you're connected 
uh, to an Apple TV, a new, another option will appear here that allows you to uh, hide the toolbar so that you're in presentation mode. And it also allows you to zoom in and out without zooming in and out on the screen. So if you want to be zoomed right in so that it's nice and big as you're writing on your iPad, the students can still see the full screen. Um, so it's almost like locking that screen. There's a little lock that will appear up on the screen. Unfortunately, I can't demonstrate it right now because it's not a, uh, it's not um, appearing because we're not connected to an Apple TV. But uh, I just want you to know that that's there. So that's good notes. Uh, for those interested in, in determining, like, how do I get that PDF file into GoodNotes, you can download it any way you want. It could be from the cloud. I'm just going to pull up a PDF from the web. So from my course website, that, uh, that same PDF file is here. I can't write on it because it's in Safari. When I tap one time, you'll notice this bar at the top appears. And it has to be a, like one tap. I'm going to put the mic close so you can kind of hear the tap. And that little bar will appear. But if you don't actually like do a, a single quick tap, that bar won't appear and you won't get the open in option to open it into Big Notes. So you can take any PDF file from your iPad, could be from the cloud, could be from the net, could be anywhere, and you can give a good note, give it one tap, put it into good notes, and all of a sudden you'll be ready to, uh, to do your note taking and so forth. Um, I do lots of notes inside of uh, good notes as well. You'll see here at a department head meeting with, uh, with my math department. And we had a lot, you know, I had this displayed up on the screen, lots of, it's kind of messy because we started with just a couple ideas and it grew as the meeting went on. So um, a lot of the department were really uh, interested in, in starting up a few things such as a lunch schedule. Um, so we did all this on the fly and then I got to send that off to them, export it straight through their email and, uh, you know, and now they've got a copy of it. I don't have to worry about running to the photocopier and so forth. So that's good notes. Awesome app, in my opinion. Um, I'll, I'll come back to the slides here. I'll, I'll essentially skip straight over the GoodNotes section because I think that that actual um, live demonstration is, is probably more effective. So I'm going to quit the application sharing if I can. There we are. Perfect. And you should see some slides now. Any yeses out there? You see slides again? Perfect. Okay, so once again, those slides, when you grab this slide deck after, you'll see much of what I've said there kind of summarized for you. Um, something I didn't tell you is the fact that you can actually take your work from any program, PowerPoint, Smart Notebook, Pages, Keynote, uh, whatever you need, Microsoft Word, send them to create a PDF and then bring them into GoodNotes. So that to me is, is really important because you don't have to actually, um, you don't really have to actually recreate anything you've done in the past. You're simply exporting the file to a PDF. So you're in, you're in pretty good hands there. Um, little summaries, as I mentioned, all the different things you can do on uh, GoodNotes, your Zoom tool, which we discussed. Um, saving to the cloud is, is my, you know, kind of way to go. I would avoid using email or iTunes unless it's just to send to one person. Um, but if you want to share with multiple people, probably the cloud's the best way to go there. And then there's that one-way sync we were talking about that allows you to, uh, to save things automatically to the cloud. So that's, uh, that's good notes. I'm just going to jump ahead. And uh, we'll talk a little bit here. I think we're actually running out of time, actually. Um, we, we're probably only a couple minutes away. And uh, Tony is asking, do you have any tips for tech, uh, for teach? Oh, for tech buy-in for digital paperless methods? So many feel that they are even too, inex are too inexperienced. Um, I would say, I would say that um, to try to get some for teacher buy-in. Yeah, for teacher buy-in, I think. You've got to start somewhere. Um, I, I don't really want to go into the uh, into the the tech rant about uh, the SAMR model. I'm I'm a, a big supporter of the SAMR model, but I also think that people get the wrong idea. I think you need to start at substitution to get 
get your foot in the door, get yourself comfortable with using technology. You can't necessarily um, expect yourself to take new technology and then run right up the SAMR ladder. Um, so I, I really think that it's important for you to um, just take it one step at a time. For me, I would say go with good notes, get yourself digital, and then as you get more comfortable, you'll start to see some of the options to bring in some of this digital content uh, across the board. So that's what we'll talk about a little bit in the app smashing. Um, someone had asked, uh, Kathy asked about handling homework assignments. For us, we are right now, because they're borrowing their iPads during the session, the homework is still for, for the most part anyway, it's still, um, it's still you know, written on paper and that's simply because they don't have the tools at home. Um, I'm hoping to this semester get into a, uh, a full-time one-to-one so that students can bring iPads home and really uh, leverage some of those tools because I think, it's, I think where the tech could be most effective is with the homework, but until all the students have it, until we you know, make sure that there's a, uh, you know, the, the equity of all students having the technology and the access to the technology, we can't really expect that from them yet. So that's kind of holding us back from extending. Um, however, that's, um, you know, that, that's something we're, we're still trying to build on. As for the green graph that uh, Wes is asking about, that's numbers. So that's part of the iWork series. Um, so you have pages here. This is numbers, which is kind of like an Excel. It's a really, really simple way to start for spreadsheets. Lots of cool things you can do in there. Um, and that would be a whole other webinar, as well as, uh, as, well as Keynote. So those ones are, are big ones as well. Um, however, we, we use primary, primarily GoodNotes to start, and then we usually do something with it. So as an example of app smashing, students might start in GoodNotes, and they might take it into a screencasting app, maybe do some video editing, or they might send it straight to their blog, or they might send it straight to the cloud from there. So there's all kinds of uh, different ways that you can take, um, take files, similar to how we exported from GoodNotes. You can export from Explain Everything. You can export from every app and open it in many different apps as well. So that's where that app smashing piece comes in. For me, screencasting kind of starts with Doceri. I, I am an Explain Everything fan. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I, I consider myself, uh, you know, a, a acquaintance of, uh, of the developer of Explain Everything. I, I love the app. For me, Doceri is really simple to use, so it's a real good place to start for your students. It's also free, so that's uh, a big, you know, a big yes for many many teachers out there. Um, Doceri kind of looks like uh, good notes on the inside. You have a toolbar at the top, all kinds of different options for your, uh, for your colors and the thickness, and you even have different pen types that you can use that I'm a big fan of. So Doceri is a, a big, big um, um, step in the right direction anyway for those looking for a free screencasting app and one that's really easy to uh, record on. Uh, all of my tutorials are done with Doceri simply because of how easy it is to use, how quick I can get in and out of it, and how stable the app is. So that's uh, any, anything you see on my YouTube channel that has writing on it will um, be recorded in Doceri. Some cool things you can do, though, after the fact is you can take some of your math work from, from GoodNotes, and you can actually use it as background. So for example, if you get Director's Pass Puppet Pals, you can actually change the background so it's math. And if there's math in the background, students can then use a character to kind of explain their work or explain their thinking. So you're not watching them do the work. Now you're listening to them actually verbally explain it using a character. It's nice uh, with the older students because I find that when, because it's a cartoon, they get to kind of act a little goofy and they don't have to be all formal and they don't worry so much if they make a mistake. So that's something that can be a time saver and also make it a little more enjoyable. Um, and uh, to answer Wes's question, I, Doceri, hands down, is better than EduCreations. The benefit you get with ed EduCreations, in my opinion, is the fact that it does kind of put it online for you and you can share it without having a YouTube account. Um, but beyond that, um, Doceri has a lot more capability. You can move things and rotate them and, and so forth while you're recording. 
a really cool app. I, I really think it's uh, over long overdue for me to do a tutorial uh, on how I use Docere and how you can create a video really quickly. So maybe that uh, should go on my short list for you guys to kind of see because there are some things that maybe aren't so intuitive at first, but they are simple once you know that they're there. Um, Telegami is kind of similar to Puppet Pals. You can use the background uh, like I had mentioned. So we'll zoom through that because I know we've only got a couple more um, a couple more minutes. So I will do some skipping of some slides here, but I did want to show this. This was um, when we talk about exploratory learning. If you haven't used Desmos, definitely check it out. There is an app, but I suggest that you run Desmos straight from your your browser. If you go to desmos.com, it's completely free. Benefits of running it from your browser include the, the ability to sign in or create an account, whereas in the app you can't. Um, you can sign in with like a Google account. So my students all have Google accounts, so they can sign in using that account and they can share files with their teacher and with each other. Um, a very awesome app, although like, at first I used to just kind of use it for like exploring lines and so forth. And uh, then I saw people starting to do these drawings. And this one isn't my students, this Angry Bird. Um, and the reason why, I'll show you on the next slide what went into creating this Angry Bird. All of these equations went into creating the Angry Bird. So I thought maybe that might not be where my students are at in grade nine. Um, but what I did find, I had my students just, the, the activity was simple. I wanted them to create something using lines. So I said it could be the first letter of your name. It could maybe be a simple stick house. It could be anything they wanted, but they needed to use at least five lines. That was kind of you know my starting point. And uh, I had a student that was struggling in the class at the time. And about a week later, like didn't, he didn't mention anything else about it. We did the, the Desmos activity. It was fun. And then a week later, he came to me and said, sir, I really want to show you something. And this is what he came to school with. And he opened this up on his iPad. And he actually drew this flower, or sorry, he called it a, a lollipop test because it started as a lollipop and then it turned into a flower. And this is a, a student named Braden, and I, I did ask him if I could use some of his artwork. Um, he, he loved it. He loved the app. Everything he did was using equations that he found online and through using the Desmos help tools. Um, you'll see here, like these are cubic functions, and you know there's an x to the five. You've got um, all kinds of quadratics and so forth. Whereas in our course, we're only supposed to be touching linear relationships. So I was really impressed by that. He continued to come into class every couple days and show me his other artwork. This is um, another lollipop that he had created. So he was obviously fascinated with the graph of that particular equation. Um, he learned how to use domain and range, which is something we don't touch in grade nine in Ontario. Um, this one is DNA. And this one's a flower that he created. So something that was really cool. Um, and he's got kind of like his, his sinusoidal functions going on at the bottom. Like, so I, I'm really excited to see you know, where he goes. He ended up be, getting one of the highest marks on our standardized test. Um, and it was just one of those things where this is what engaged him. It might not engage everyone, but if, if we offer them all kinds of opportunities with technology to find something they're passionate about, I think we can really, um, you know, get kids excited to learn. And, uh, and there you go, better than Patrick's test prep for sure. I, I would definitely agree. This is another student. His name's David. Um, he was, he would probably be a student I think is probably gifted, but he's very bored in class. And after he saw Braden's work, he started challenging himself. And this is what he came up with. Um, so very, you know, very interesting to me that he wasn't necessarily struggling in the class, but he just usually was disengaged in class. Um, you know, he just, unless we were doing a, a, like a, a really cool activity, um, you know, everything else was just kind of secondary for him. And, and this is what he came up with. So I was really excited to see that. So that's Desmos. Um, there's obviously all kinds of gaming options. I'll show you one gaming option and then we'll kind of get ready to close it out because I don't want to keep you here too too much longer. I have a habit of, of going on forever. So um, I did want to talk, I'll, I'll skip over Algebra Touch, although definitely check it out. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about Dragon Box, which is a game about isolating a box. 
And ultimately what you find, students will play this game and they'll find as they go on, they're actually solving equations. So what I've done is I've created a couple lessons where we've taken out, uh, we've taken screenshots of different levels and then I have students represent each of the cards as their own variables. So they get to actually decide what the variables are. So if it's B for, you know, big dragon or D for dragon or whatever they want, um, it's really up to them. And, and then they write it in an algebraic representation. So something like this level, um, this is some student work, might look like this. So a student said that this card was A, and he said this card was B. And you'll notice if there's a night and day card, one's positive, one's negative. And then they write it out as an equation. And what they start to do is cancel out like terms in order to, um, in order to start simplifying. And as the levels go on, we get to the bottom of it and you, they see that, you know what, the box, which they called X, is equal to this card here, which is A. And all it does, it helps them make that connection that we talked about in part three of the four-part lesson. So um, just some ideas for you to use with, uh, with Dragon Box and some of the other gaming. Um, I, I'm really into the idea of gamification. I'm not, you know, full-blown everything needs to be game. I'm not sure if I'm just not comfortable with it yet. Um, but I do see the powers of it, and I, I definitely think you should explore at least the Dragon Box. And if you have other ideas, let me know. It would be great. Um, so I'm going to jump ahead to um, the last little tidbit of information here. So these slides are available to you. Feel free to, uh, to access them. But I did want to show you a little bit about the creation side of things. Um, I created a, a math blogging network called mathblogs.ca um, where they get to essentially create a WordPress blog um, and they get to essentially name their blog something like uh, Tommy mathblogs.ca as you see here. So um, they get to essentially create their own math blog. They get to um, style it any way they'd like. It is their blog to keep and it's completely free. Um, and you get to, they get to post some of their digital work and then verbalize it through writing. So it's a great way to introduce literacy in math class as well as the communication in math class. And you can see this particular student um, really had an understanding of distance time graphs as she explained through this little paragraph here. So um, if you're interested in trying out mathblogs.ca, feel free. And uh, it's hosted by WordPress. Um, I own the domain name, so it's literally just, you know, it's a domain name I paid, you know, and bought. And I created the network, so it's owned by me. But if, uh, you know, if a lawsuit came up, then we'll pretend I don't own it. <laughs> but I, I don't think we'll have any issues like that. Um, it's there. I created it more or less for my students to use. And uh, I figured, you know what, why not share that with as many people as we definitely, uh, as we can. So feel free to explore math blogs. If you're digital, it's great. Even if you're not digital, they can still do some math blogging from home on their own personal computers. They don't need an iPad or an Android to do it. Um, they can upload photos from anywhere and uh, really start to uh, improve the communication um, throughout their, uh, their math and their learning. So with that said, I'm going to skip right out to, uh, to my let me know page here. I do have a feedback form up if you'd be so kind to uh, leave me. It's, it's just basically anything that you found that was, you know, good, anything that could be improved, I'd really appreciate it. I'll add the link into the chat window. It's been uh, awesome being able to join you today. So if you could provide some feedback, that would be great so I can uh, get I better as I move I did find a couple forward. of questions and, in chat uh, that guess we'll, neither we'll Kyle nor my, my Tony there, and I'll, answered I'll send it back way. to, uh, to Peggy um, and Tony to send us out for the week. And this uh, goes back to part of the, the, the funding. Do students bring their own styluses to work with the iPads? Or uh, were, were styluses part of the funding for the project? That's a great question. We actually tried a number of different styluses. On my blog, if you use the little search bar and just type in stylus, you'll see a few, uh, a few posts um, related to different styluses I tried. And you know, there's even one post way back when that said, you know, I think I found the perfect stylus. And then a month later it was, oh, no, I didn't because they all broke. Uh, so there's um, 
styluses that are out there. The I had originally had some funding. Those styluses have since, you know, crumpled away and, and died off. Um, so we don't provide styluses now. Students are welcome to purchase styluses, so some mm -hmm. do, but many don't. I myself, I don't even use a stylus when I write uh, at the front of the class. I'm using my finger. Mm -hmm. um, everything I did today that you saw on my screen share when I was writing the date, that was all just with my index finger. You know, I just kind of hold my index finger like a pencil and, uh, you know, it's really convenient because then I can still use the uh, the gestures, the hand gestures to go, you know, four finger swipe back and forth between apps and so forth. So um, I think it's a personal preference, but yeah, no funding for it uh, anymore at least. Mm -hmm. And there was one other question that was different and that is, are these apps accessible for screen readers such as those for vision impaired students? Very interesting question. Um, that I do not have the answer to. I, I've never been in that situation um, mm -hmm. as of yet. Um, but that, yeah, I, w I wouldn't want to say yes or no. I, I'm sure some yes and probably some no. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I if I have the information to answer that one accurately. Sorry. Okay. If, if I could say uh, one comment to that, uh, I have a student who has vision problems. I'm a one-on-one -on -one TA with him and everything we use can be um, set so that he can see it. It can be the settings in the accessibility of the iPad. So hopefully that answers oh, okay. her questions and quite often we'll We'll put it up on the smart board so it's bigger for him to see. Mm -hmm. Or in my student's case, he has access to a closed circuit TV so it's closer to him mm -hmm. and he doesn't have to stretch his neck so far to see all that's on the smart board. And for this next coming school year, we've uh, purchased a Dell computer that's 23 inch touch screen so that he'll be able to, to interact with his screen and also see it. So I'll be pairing the iPad with this new Dell computer. So hopefully that answers some of that question. Yeah, I think it does, Tony. Thanks very much. Those those are only the two different questions that were not answered as we went along. So because of the time, I will continue with the ending part of the show. Uh, Peggy, did you want to take over for the upcoming shows? Absolutely. Uh, this has been such an inspiring, motivating session. Kyle, thank you so much. We all have some new resources to check out now. And those of us that weren't feeling all that confident about math now have some new courage. So thank you. We do want to let you know that we meet almost every Saturday for Classroom 2.0 Live. We have a great show coming up next Saturday with Paul Bogish, who is an eighth grade teacher who is doing some incredible things. And he's going to, there were so many things he could share with us, but we've narrowed it down. And he's going to be sharing about creative, fun, engaging assessments for students, things that actually students enjoy doing. So that's going to be great. And then uh, we're not ready to announce our August 23rd show, but it's going to be a good one. Um, but we'll announce it next week. We won't have a show on uh, Labor Day weekend, August 30th. Uh, I know that many schools are starting back up right after Labor Day, but many have already started. So September 6th, we have Joan Young joining us. She has written a fabulous book about encouragement in the classroom and she's going to be sharing a bunch of her tips about ways you can motivate and encourage your students. And then on September 13th, we're going to have a great live binder presentation. This is uh, was one of the top 10 uh, ePortfolio live binders last year and Karma Yancey created it and it's uh, all about career development and how her students explored careers using live binders, curating all those resources, and we're going to get to see the actual live binder examples. So I hope you'll plan on joining us same time every week, noon Eastern time. 
also do want to remind you about the Learning Revolution. This is Steve Hargaden's site where he brings all these things together. So all of his virtual conferences and webinars and amazing things going on virtually can all be found at thelearningrevolution.com. So be sure to sign up for his newsletter so you get all those updates. And I do want to let you know that we just finished a great conference. It was the homeschoolconference.com. We even have Jackie Gerstein in the room today. And she did an awesome presentation in that conference. All of the um, videos and are available as recordings now. So you can go back and check those out and see if there's something you'd like to watch. The virtual film festival is still going on. See, what's exciting about that is you get to watch an entire film. These are educational documentary kinds of films. And then you get to watch a live interview and interact with the film director being interviewed by Steve Hargadon. So be sure to check that out if uh, that's interesting to you. And now I'm going to turn it back to Lori. Thank you, Penny. Peggy. Um, you can nominate a featured teacher for a month yourself, like uh, Kyle was a featured teacher today. Um, there's a form to fill out, tinyurl.com slash cr20live featured teacher nominate without the e at the end. You can also nominate yourself if you want to to uh, become a featured teacher for the month. When you exit the show today, you should, your browser should open a link for the Classroom 2.0 Live survey. Um, if it doesn't, um, the link is in the Live Binder. Uh, it's in the chat right now as well. So there are many ways to get to the survey to um, comment on today's show. Also at the bottom of that survey, you'll find spots to request a professional development certificate. One, you enter your name. The other, you enter your email address. Now, when you enter your email address, please make sure it's a personal email and not your school email address, because lots of schools will block this email from, from getting to you. There's also a link on the slide for the survey itself. Both video recordings and audio recordings from shows are available at iTunes U at this website, tinyurl.com slash cr20live iTunes U. So you can listen or watch and listen on mobile devices. There also is an RSS feed for recordings that the link is on the website. Peggy's posted the Live Binder link in the chat yet again. So there are many different ways to get to recordings. And again, special thanks to Kyle Pierce, our featured teacher today, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing the website, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks very much for coming.